our country and our world look like in 25 years. Let's think about the next generation. Let's think about the leadership that is required to fix our problems, to bring our country together. Because I don't think that any of us want to see the continuing drift that is happening to America. We know as we look around our country and the world that people are facing some very difficult times. You know, I started this campaign a little less than a year ago saying that I want to have a conversation with the American people. Because I think too often those of us running forward holding office, we talk too much. We don't listen enough. We don't hear the real voices and concerns of the American people. You know, in the time that I've spent here in Nevada, I've had people literally shout with anguish and pain over what's happening to them. I was here in Reno a few days ago and listening to a representative group of residents of this area tell me what's happening in their lives. And one gentleman got so agitated he said, you know, I've paid my insurance premiums on time, everything I was asked to do. And I was just diagnosed with prostate cancer. And the insurance company just canceled my policy. What am I supposed to do, he said. They tell me I've got to come up with $50,000 to have an operation. He said, I've saved that money to send my kids to college and to help my older daughter, who's out on her own. What am I supposed to do, he said. A woman in Las Vegas took me aside and said, Senator, what's going to happen to me and my family? We're going to lose our home. We're being foreclosed on. And I'm told the reason that I can't afford to pay the new interest rate is because I actually was trying to pay a little more as I went along. I put a little extra money in my checks for a couple of months. And it turns out that because I was trying to do the right thing, they raised my interest rate on me. It's called a prepayment penalty. And she said, now I can't, I can't figure out what to do. Another woman here in Reno last week told me she'd gotten her mortgage from Countrywide. <laughs> And when she filled out the papers, she said there were some things in there that didn't make sense to her, but I don't know how many of you have ever read your mortgage documents. I have. <laughs> you know, you talk to people, you listen to people, you say what's in there, you try to get the best advice. Well, she, she asked questions. She said, wait a minute, you're writing down here that my salary could be up to $300,000 a year, but I make $12 an hour. And the broker said, well, that's just a category that your occupation falls into. Don't worry about that. And of course, the person who sold her the house with that mortgage got a higher commission because of the way he set it up. So she makes $12 an hour, and the interest rates keep going up. So she calls back to Countrywide, and she said, look, I'm not going to be able to pay. What can we do to work this out? I work hard. And they said, well, how about borrowing more money? She said, I can't borrow any more money. Now she's 64 years old and she's about to lose her home. Or the woman that uh, I met in Reno, who has three boys, she's a single mom, she works full time. She doesn't have any health insurance. One of her sons needs an operation. The longer she postpones it because she can't pay for it, more difficult it will become. She said, you know, I make too much money to qualify for any kind of help. So what should I do, quit my job so that I can qualify? What are we doing to each other? You know, the American middle class is the backbone of this country. It is the guarantor of the American dream. challenges because I don't think there is a challenge that America can't meet. You know, 
to be an American. You know, my parents worked hard. My dad was in the Navy, came out of World War II, wanted to save enough money to buy a house, wanted to start a small business, wanted to start a family. He didn't ask anything from anybody. But he also believed that our country was always on his side. That our country wanted him to succeed. My dad was always suspicious of big business and big government. He said, you know, we need to keep the focus on the people who do the work in this country. And that's not what's been happening in the last seven years. There's been a still away from the middle class, the hard working families, the work that are in the You know, it's, for a while, we heard a lot of happy talk about the economy. You know, every time I would say something about how the economy's not working, and the average American family's lost $1,000 in income, you know, somebody would come out in Washington and say, well, look at the stock market. <laughs> look at corporate profits. They always had an answer. And I'd say, you're looking at the wrong things. Yes. What matters is what goes on in people's daily lives. How secure they feel about their future. You know, when somebody stands up in Las Vegas and says to me, between me and my husband, we have four jobs. It's pretty hard to have any more than that. <laughs> So we've got to get back to putting our priorities in order. So here's what I want to do. If you give me the chance, if you caucus for me tomorrow, if you get behind me, here's what I want to do with your help. Because I know that a president can't wave a magic wand. You know, after the speeches are over and the television cameras are gone, you've got to make decisions. You've got to do the job. And I know that if a president doesn't try to run the government and manage the economy, the government will manage the president. And you'll pretty soon, once again, have gridlock and have a sense that nothing's getting done because nobody's in charge. And if a president delegates too much power to government functionaries or outside advisors, then who are we going to hold accountable? I want to be held accountable. I want to be held accountable to the taxpayers and the citizens of the matter.